Good morning and welcome to Redeemer this morning. We're glad you've joined us and, and glad that you are here in worship with us today. I will remind you that Holy Communion will be part of our worship later today. And uh, we invite you to get your elements ready to use there in your home to join communion with us. I do need to remind you that Lent begins this Wednesday with our Ash Wednesday worship service. We will be broadcasting a service right here on uh, Facebook uh, at 10 o'clock this coming Wednesday. I invite you to join us for that, that time. And then between the hours of 4.30 and 6, we invite you to drive through for uh, the imposition of ashes and Holy Communion. You'll stay in your car. Um, Vicar Amanda is going to use a Q-tip to do the ashes on you so we won't be spreading any germs or anything like that. So um, we invite, we're not sure where we're going to be on the property yet. We're still working that out. If it is inclement weather, you certainly you will need to drive around the church. We'll be over here at the covered driveway so we're not getting rained on uh, the entire time. So anyway, please join us. That's between 4.30 and 6 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon late. We invite you to come by for the imposition of ashes and Holy Communion. And go ahead and wear your masks for that too. Go ahead and wear your masks. Yes, please. Yes. So we have a few things happening on our social media pages. Um, first of all, we have a little Friday fun game going on, and this week it's for Debbie. Debbie's wanted to travel to this one place and see these one sets of things. So make your guess on our Facebook page. It's a set of things? Well, I mean, it's, it's one thing, but there are many of them. Okay. And I'm going to stop there before I give too many hints. Anyhow... Um, some other things that are happening um, in our digital world, since we can't gather for our Shrove Tuesday Pancake Supper and the talent show and all of that, we're encouraging everyone to go ahead and have pancakes for dinner on Tuesday. And then you can take a picture of you and your pancakes and all the yumminess that goes with that, and you can send it to me and we'll have a montage of our pancakes and celebrate online together with our pictures. In the go and serve, my email address has a typo. Um, so if you send those pictures to me, send them to aburke at relu.church. Um, also, I noticed when I was driving in that our blessing box is very, very empty. Um, we have a lot of people that are coming by. There's a lot of need in our area. So if you're at the grocery store this week and um, think about it, please pick up a few extra items and drop them by the blessing box. And for those who are um, participating in the 2 o'clock Sunday book study, and we're continuing that today, and we'll see you there on Zoom for chapters 3 and 4 of What's So Amazing About Grace. Those are all my announcements, Pastor Gary. Okay, I'm still pondering how you take a picture of yumminess. I don't know. That's up to interpretation. Okay. <laughs> well, I was kind of pondering that. Yeah, you can continue pondering that until Tuesday when you take your picture. Okay. Okay. Let us prepare for our worship with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out on all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins, and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. 
How vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away, and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community, living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and also, also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to
The Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, the resplendent light of your truth shines from the mountaintop into our hearts. Transfigure us by your beloved Son and illumine the world, world with your image through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Be seated and we invite the children to gather around the screen for their special time. Normally, I do not start a children's sermon with this kind of phrase, but I'm going to do that today. Does anybody know what day it is? Well, of course, it's Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day to y'all. And you know what I found this week? I got, oh, wait, they went down into the thing. This is not good. I have a little pocket here on my folder, and... They went down, let's see if I, I think I got them. No, I didn't. There you go. I found some Dr. Seuss Valentines. Yay, this is so cool. Here's the cat in the hat. And it says, have a super de duper Valentine's Day. Yay. And here he is again. It's, oh no, no, this is not, yeah, this, is, this is my favorite Dr. Seuss book, Green Eggs and Ham. It says, do you like green eggs and ham on Valentine's Day? There you go. And here's the cat in the hat again. Hope your Valentine's Day is filled with wonderful surprises. Here's another of my favorites, Yertle the Turtle. And he says, happy Valentine's Day from marvelous me to marvelous you. And here's Horton. And Horton has a very special happy Valentine's Day for you. And then another one of my favorite books. Funny things are everywhere on Valentine's Day. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. Great book. And I don't even know what this one comes from, but it says, Happy Valentine's Day. Stay, play, and say okay. And finally, here's a picture of thing one and thing two. And it says, Thing one and thing two would like to say, Happy Valentine's Day to you. Well, I don't know if at your school or with your friends or or even with your parents, you might have shared Valentine's. You, you give them a Valentine, they give you a Valentine. It's how we tell each other that we love each other. And I wanted to mention that today because, guess what? When we love each other, that love starts with God's love for us. And just like we spread Valentine's around to other people, telling them of our love, we should spend our days telling other people about God's love for them. That God loves all of us, and it just grows and grows and grows and gets bigger and bigger as we share the news about God loving all of us. So when you look at your Valentine's, or even if you think about Valentine's Day, you can remember it's a day about love and we can spend it telling about God's love. Let's pray, okay? God of love, remind us today and every day how much you love us and help us to share your love with others. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. from 2 Kings. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. 
So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elisha said to him, Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, and as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. So you might find this surprising, or maybe not, but in high school I was a really big nerd. And I used the word nerd with the most loving of ways. I was a band nerd, a theater nerd, and a chemistry super nerd. One of the things that I always loved about chemistry was the idea of the makeup of atoms, the smallest, tiniest bits of matter. If the particles in an atom are just slightly different, it's a completely 
different element. And things happen to change these atoms that make up our entire world. For example, there's copper. Copper is a reddish metal that is used in many ways, and one of the most famous of which is the Statue of Liberty on Ellis Island in New York. That statue is made of copper, but it's not a reddish metal color. It's a light green. Because of weathering, the copper oxidizes, and it gets this patina, this green color to it. But it doesn't change or deteriorate the copper. Underneath that greenish patina, the copper is still copper. It's just that the outside of it looks different. But what happens when copper is melted together with zinc? It becomes brass. And while there's an outward change in appearance, a new brassy golden color appears, there's also a fundamental change in what these items together have become. They have made a stronger metal alloy. They have transformed into something new. That word, transform, has a lot to it. To change into another substance, to change in character or structure. Sometimes the word transfigure is used as a synonym and vice versa. But this is where dictionary.com and I respectfully disagree. When something is transfigured, it is an outward change. It can also be a change that glorifies and exalts. There are nuances that make the concepts of transform and transfigure very different. Transformation is a fundamental change through and through. Transfiguration is an outward change that can glorify. And I don't think that we can use these words to substitute for one another. I don't think they're interchangeable. And so today, we have Transfiguration Sunday. Not Transformation Sunday, it's Transfiguration Sunday. We have the Gospel of Mark that tells us of Jesus taking Peter and James and John to the top of a mountain apart by themselves. There's a reason why we have the phrase mountaintop experiences. Important things happen on the tops of mountains. And this trip to the top of the mountain certainly didn't disappoint. Jesus was transfigured. Jesus himself, through and through, didn't change. He was the same, fully God, fully human, the second person of the Trinity. But his appearance changed, and he was glorified and exalted. His clothes became a dazzling white, and Elijah and Moses appeared A cloud covered the mountain, and the voice of God, the Creator, doled out love and instructions. Jesus had been transfigured. Peter, James, and John were there to witness it. But now it was time to head back down the mountain. What an amazing experience. I can only imagine what those three disciples were feeling. How do you even process all of that? And then Jesus adds, Oh, and don't tell anybody about this until after I've risen from the dead. What? Don't tell anybody? You're rising from the dead? There's so much there. So our reading for the day ends with verse 10 saying, 
So they kept the matters to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. I'm curious, is that all the disciples questioned? Did they question the dazzling white clothing? Did they question seeing Elijah and Moses, or the cloud and the voice of God, or just the rising from the dead part? I don't know, but I wonder. Yes, it was the transfiguration of Jesus. But I wonder if this was a transformational moment for these disciples. Were they changed by this experience? Did the sights, sounds, and experiences of the mountaintop change them in a fundamental way? I can't imagine being present for all of that and then not seeing with new eyes, or hearing with fresh ears, or asking questions in a much deeper way. So if we ask these questions of the first disciples, how do we wrestle with that question for ourselves? How do we see the figure of Christ Do we see Christ in the people that are around us or the kindness of others? Do we see Christ in the beauty of creation? And if we see, are we changed? It's an important element of our discipleship, an important part of us following Jesus. How does that relationship change us, or does it? It comes down to the question, do we let our faith affect each and every part of our lives? How does our relationship with Christ transform our relationships with others, our friendships? Perhaps we choose to live deeper into our friendships because Christ calls us to support one another and walk in accountability with each other. Or our partnerships and marriages. Perhaps we choose to lean into unconditional love for our partners and spouses because we're recipients of God's unconditional love. Has our relationship with Christ transformed our relationships as parents, children, family, and friends? We can ask a similar question of what we do in the world around us. Our jobs, careers, and volunteering. Do we consider our faith and walk with Jesus as we interact with our work and coworkers? Is our relationship with God a part of our choices in careers, in the companies and the organizations we work with? Are we transformed for volunteering and sharing the love of God with others in various ways? In being transformed by our relationship with Jesus, we're also transformed for our life in community. As followers of Christ, the gospel of Jesus should influence how we live in and amongst society. How does our relationship with Jesus affect how we interact with people of different cultures, races, religions, and nationalities? Are our attitudes and behaviors towards people in poverty, those seeking safety, the marginalized, the oppressed, Are those attitudes influenced by our relationship with Jesus and the truth of the gospel? The gospel is powerful. I hope that we are changed by it. I hope that we live differently because of the word of God. 
We are called to have a transformational relationship with Jesus. Like the disciples had questions about the transfiguration of Jesus, we too ask questions, explore our relationship, and allow Christ's life, death, and resurrection to change us through and through. Following Christ, who was transfigured on a mountaintop, means that we live transformed lives. Lives transformed by the gospel. Lives transformed for the sake of the world. We are witnesses to the transfigured Christ. The Spirit walks with us each day as God the Creator sends us out into society to love one another. Amen.
Gathered as God's people, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Almighty Lord and Savior, today we see you revealed in glory. Thank you for this gift, O Jesus. Help us to open our lives to your work in us. Lead us in giving our lives to serve others that you might shine through us. Lord, in your mercy, word of love open our ears this day to listen to you truly there is nowhere else for us to go truly you have the words of eternal life create a hunger in us for your word lord god draw us near to your hearts unite our wills with your will Lead us always and strengthen us to follow. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful Savior, our world is in need of being transformed. Where our world is wrong, make it right in your love. End the divisions that separate us. Unite us as your people, living in love and understanding. Heal the sick, comfort the sorrowed, ease the burdens that so many carry. Bless all your people, O God, and especially those whom we remember before you. Lord, in your mercy. Finally, O God, transform us by your presence with us every day. Change us by your spirit so that, forgiven, we reach out to others in mercy. Charge us with zeal and enthusiasm in our faith that we may live your love. Lord, in your mercy, Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you.
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son. And in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven. We praise your name and join their unending hymn. Oh. which was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Let us pray. Christ Jesus, at this table we have feasted on your very life and strengthened and are strengthened for our journey. 
Send us forth from this banquet, nourished in body and in spirit, to proclaim your good news and to serve others in your name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.